please pray with me. Holy Lord, may thy word only be spoken and thy word only be heard. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we continue our walk with Jesus toward the cross. But what does that actually mean? In the gospel reading today, Jesus says to his disciples and to the gathered crowd, if anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So what did that mean to them? And what does it mean to us and to the wider church? During this Lenten season, it is customary for some to decide to give up something. Maybe to give up chocolate or alcohol or swearing or gossiping or lying in on a Sunday morning. And apologies to those watching who are sick and weren't able to make it this morning. Or speeding or, or whatever it is. Relatively painless. Or maybe we'll decide that actually it doesn't make any difference, so why would we do it anyway? Except that it does make a difference that we recognize Lent. Ash Wednesday reminded us that the fast that God chooses is to share food with the hungry, to find homes for the homeless, and clothes for those who need them. And in so many wonderful ways, you in this church do tirelessly just that. But alongside that, Jesus asks for something else. He asks us for total Submission. Submission is not a popular word or concept in our culture, and it's certainly been misused and abused, especially with regard to women. But this is not a submission to abusive power, but to absolute love, to forgiveness, to grace, and to mercy. Our Lord's walk to the cross was the walk to death of the most excruciating pain and shame for all to see. We're used to seeing cleaned up images with a cloth draped over Jesus so as not to offend. But no such pandering to the niceties of a Sunday morning service were provided on the cross, which was bloody and filthy and covered in excrement and with unimaginable pain every time a breath was demanded, often lasting for several days or until the legs were broken and the body collapsed in on itself. It was the height of shame and the most extreme pain to the God who created us all, who created this world. Artists over the centuries have produced cleaned up images because the reality is just too gruesome to ponder. Better to have something clean or go straight to the resurrection. So we display beautiful instruments of torture and death in our churches and around our necks. Why not the gallows? As a former parish, at a former parish where I was, a woman who rarely attended church and when she did only wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit, asked me why we spend so much time talking about the crucifixion. After all, she said, it's only one day. It's better to move on quickly, right? Move past, skip along, merrily, clapping our hands. Life is but a dream, people are tortured, babies are murdered, our young people are stabbed and gunned down and kicked to death or die from overdoses. Our elders die alone and uncared for, refugees die in the cold, but let's keep skipping along, merrily, merrily, we've been saved, life is but a dream. Except it isn't. And Jesus doesn't tell us to skip along, he tells us to follow him and to deny ourselves and follow the cross. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Please, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of times when, perhaps not skipping, 
but time to enjoy and rejoice in our salvation and the freedom from the burden of sin that Christ's death has afforded us. But if we fail to spend some time in the Lenten wilderness, then it is not but cheap grace. Death, Christ's death is of little consequence. St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied by its power. Foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being, being saved, it is the power of God. And he wrote, For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. A stumbling block for many. For most, I think, many in this congregation, we are willing to walk in the wilderness, to submit ourselves to Christ's loving gaze, willing to let the Spirit shine in us into those places that we don't want anyone to know about. Those hidden sins, the, hit, the sins of pride and avarice, those little white lies, to expose those areas we prefer not to think about. We are called instead to pray, precious Lord, with your help and to the best of our ability, we will go where you lead. We will take the name of Jesus on our lips and bend our knees in submission. We'll seek to trust whatever faces us because we are not alone. And we will recognize as much as we are able the price that our Lord paid on the cross for us, for each one of us. Because it wasn't just the physical pain, it was the torment of taking, can you imagine the sin of the whole world? No, we can't possibly imagine. And for us, no, it's not an easy road. It was never promised to be. When Jesus began to teach his disciples that he, the Son of Man, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and by the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again, Peter, speaking on behalf of the disciples, rebuked him. Peter, the very same man who had just moments before had declared, you, Jesus, are the Messiah. And if we were to flip back in Mark's gospel, we would read the paragraph placed just before the reading today, in which we would encounter Jesus with the blind man who begged Jesus to touch him. And if you're familiar with that passage, you know that the first time that Jesus lays, touches with saliva, touches the blind man, he's able to see, but only partially. And then a second time, when Jesus touches him, his sight is fully restored. So I think Mark wants us to draw a parallel here. He wants us to hear. Peter was something like that blind man. He declared Jesus to be the Messiah, but his sight was partially restored and only able to see a little through that glass dimly, if you like, which I think most of us are looking through. Peter's idea of a Messiah did not allow for the shameful death of a criminal. Peter saw in part and interpreted it in his own way. He didn't want to believe that the Messiah would undergo suffering and be killed. That isn't how it's supposed to happen. So what was Peter's understanding of the Messiah? Like many others still today, the Messiah was the anointed one, the promised deliverer of Israel, who will fill Old Testament prophecy, the anticipated king and deliverer who will bring salvation to the world. And his crown would not be of thorns, but of gold. Jesus' teaching about great suffering and rejection and death did not fit that anticipated picture. So instead of submitting to Jesus, Peter actually adopts the role of one who knows better than God. Who 
would have thought? None of us would do that, right? Or does Mark have a foggy message for us today? Okay, Lord, I'm going to do this, so I'd just like you to bless that. Okay, that's fine, thank you. It didn't quite go the way I'd planned. Maybe if I'd spent a little more time asking you first, it might have worked out better. You know what I mean. But here, Peter is standing right in front of our Lord, taking him aside and basically challenging. I think to challenge God is a little bit, you're never quite sure. I mean, we know that Abraham and some of the others did challenge a couple of times, but in this particular respect, I think Marx makes it clear it wasn't a very good idea. However, it then opened the way for Jesus to say again who he was and exactly where Peter was to be, and it wasn't in front of him. Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Our ways, we are reminded again, are not God's ways. And for the most of the part, I think, we haven't got a clue. Thomas Merton, in one of his prayers, says, I have no idea where I'm going, but I believe my desire to please you does please you. We stumble along, but God help us if we, call another, if we cause another to stumble. Jesus said to the crowd and to the disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So what does that mean? We sometimes heard people say, well, that's just the cross that I have to bear. And it generally seems to be rather a flippant saying for life's annoying little challenges. But for us to take up the cross is something I think rather different. It's very unlikely most of us will have to carry that bar up a hill. One of the worst tortures, instruments of torture. But it may mean going to places we don't want to go. It may mean making changes in our life we don't much want to do. It will almost certainly wish for us to place our lives in the scarred hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it will almost certainly mean that as we proclaim the gospel, we will face resistance and opposition and rejection from the enemy. We are called to submission and to prayer. We're reminded that there is power in prayer, especially collective prayer. We gather at church together for a reason. Bishop Asbel, in his weekly letter printed and plugged in, um, this week, he talks about how he and his wife have decided throughout Lent to, uh, to pray together morning prayer. And he said even when he's traveling, you know, they can, they can talk on the phone or by Zoom and pray together every morning, morning prayer. It's that faithful persistence despite the opposition that forms us. The careful and prayerful reading of scripture the gathering with one another, even if we have to do it online or over the phone, supporting one another, and then allowing our Lord to weed out those things in us, to submit to him. Because, said Jesus, those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in his glory. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be face that. We will all face judgment. But I want to do the best that I can with God's help, and I know you do too. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess the King of glory now. In your hearts enthrone him. There let him subdue all that is not holy, all that is not true. Crown him as your savior in temptation's hour. Let his will enfold you in its light and power. Amen.